me that was recording in the meeting chat or on this all stream. Got it. So I wonder if the recording is going to be switching. Like when I talk, it switches to me. And then when you talk, it switches back like some of the meeting apps. But we'll see. So all right, we'll go ahead and start. Hi, guys. Welcome to Pro Shop Talk here at the Master's Craft. I'm Daniel. I'm the technical director here. And uh, this is a series where we get to talk with some of our vendor partners about the products and processes that they have for wood flooring professionals and contractors. So today we get to talk with Brian Rathbun. He is a territory manager for Bona and uh, good to have him on the line. So Brian, welcome and how are you doing? Good, how's everybody doing out there? Good, good, well, hopefully good. So tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of your history. Uh, again, thanks for the introduction, Daniel. Um, I'm Brian Rathbun, Territory Manager for the Rocky Mountains, um, which I have here in the background, or maybe those are Rockies, I'm not quite sure where that's from. Uh, I've been in the industry for 28 years. Uh, started in my career in uh, Germany, in the German Apprentice Program, then came back here to the States and uh, had ran my own company from uh, 1997 until uh, 2015. I uh, started Bona in, in February of 2015 and been with them ever since. Um, I'm an NWFA certified installer, sand and finisher, CEU presenter, and also a NWFA inspector, although I, I don't inspect currently right now because of the conflicts of interest. Um, but uh, I have an extreme passion for this industry, that is for sure. Awesome. Good deal. I know you've got a ton of experience with wood floors, and so hopefully you can uh, help illuminate some things for guys today. So I think today what we're going to talk about is your Bona Dry Fast Stain System and yes. uh, talk about some of the features of that and kind of how guys use it and, and uh, things like that. So why don't you just go ahead and give us a quick introduction to your guy's stain. What, what kind of a stain is it and, uh, and what are some features of that? So we have uh, 26 colors in our stain lineup. Um, it is an oil modified product. Um, the nice thing about our stains is that they, uh, they penetrate, they stain and seal the wood floor. So our stains are designed to be applied and then afterwards uh, the contractor can coat it with two coats of finish. Uh, there's no sealer required. I think the biggest benefit of our stains is the fact that uh, the, the workability of it. Um, it, they they self dissolve and reactivate and what I mean by that is when we teach at schools um, it's not unusual for us to take the lid from a stain can and put it face down and leave a nice ring on the floor and uh, leave that for 20 30 minutes sometimes an hour um, I've even done it up to two hours and uh, contractors are they're freaking out like what are you going to do about that and uh, we just leave it sitting there um, but the fact that our, our stains re-dissolve and reincorporate back in another, um, it really minimizes the lap lines and, and marks. If a guy dribbles a little bit of stain on the floor, putting fresh stain on top of it will reactivate it and blend it in. Awesome. Good deal. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, how guys prepare for your stain. So like, what is the typical guy gonna do to get ready for staining? What's what's the sanding sequence he's gonna end on? How's he gonna clean and get ready for it? Kind of what what leads up to that staining process? Yes, we, we do have published uh, sanding grit and guidelines. Um, we're certainly not in the business of trying to tell guys that this is the only way to sand a floor. <clears throat> we just have what we call our recommended best practices. So a typical sanding sequence would be they're you know, doing a rough cut in a 50 or 60 grit, uh, intermediate cut with uh, 80 grit, and then finishing off the floor with 100 or 120 grit. The mm -hmm. key, key components to sanding floors, though, is that we don't want guys to skip a grit. So if he starts at 40, his next grit would be either a 60 um, or an 80, uh, you know, we just don't want a guy going from a 40 grit rough cut and going all the way to like 100 grit. Um, well, actually a 40 to an 80 would be skipping 50 and 60. So um, 40 cut would be followed by a 60 grit. Um, you know, we're really creating a surface profile. Um, so we, our stains can then, you know, penetrate and seal that wood. Um, that grit sequence step 
uh, if their guys are skipping it, that's where they can get into problems with saying the little lines and, and heavy marks that fine sandpaper is not going to remove. Sure. So then you said mm -hmm. they're in about 100, 120 grit, somewhere in there, probably 120 for darker colors, 100 for a little bit lighter colors. So, Correct. Okay. Yeah. So guy guy sands it, gets done with his final sanding, and then um, just vacuums, tacks off, dry tacks, and then they're ready to stain? Yeah, vacuum, uh, tack it. Um, I'm a big fan of our Tampico head, which is actually a, probably an underutilized tool. Um, yeah. It's a soft horsehair bristle brush. It's a 16-inch um, brush that goes on a buffer. So we're not asking a guy to do an extra step. We're just replacing it. Um, so you vacuum the edges and then you have your Tampico head um, on your buffer. Obviously, you've got to be hooked up to dust containment, which we're big fans of having dust containment. But that soft bristle brush will um, break loose that soft powder from the sanding process, get it airborne, and then the vacuum system can pick it up. Yeah, and so yeah. a typical sequence would be, say, you guys doing a 1,000 square feet. He Tampico heads the entire floor. He's already got a buffer in there anyways. Um, and then vacuum the edges and a dry tack, and they're ready to apply stain. Um, okay. The nice thing about that Tampico head too, Daniel, is that um, the contractor's now, he's just staining wood floors, not wood floors plus dust. So he gets a, a better effect from the stain. And I would assume if you're going to use like a Tampico brush, you'd do that before you water pop. So you'd brush off and then you'd water pop and Correct. then you'd, and then you'd be ready to stain. But with your stains, you, you uh, don't have to water pop, certainly optional. Um, but I'm assuming that it, uh, in addition to making the color absorb a little bit more and getting it a little bit darker, it probably also helps even out the floor. Um, even, even out the color as well, take any uh, errors and sanding out of the floor. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the water popping, because the guy had to sand the floor, like especially a darker stain up to about 120 grit, it really closes down the wood tissue. Yeah. Um, so if they want that dark, rich color, water popping um, is a good way to do that. It, plus it doubles the color palette. Um, all of our stains can be mixed with one another. You can do two parts of one stain to one part another or whatever. I mean, the limitation of the stain blends is really just between your ears. Um, I caution guys, though, to don't use water popping to fix uh, improper sanding. Um, the water popping is to work on hard or wild grain species um, and to give a more uniform appearance. But I, I don't want guys using water popping to hide... Um, uh, improper sanding process. Sure, sure. Okay. So now we've gotten up to the actual application. How would you recommend uh, applying the stain? And in addition to that, like what are all the different ways that a guy could apply the stain? I know a lot of contractors have a lot of different methods. There's pad on, pad off, there's rag on, rag off, there's brush on, rag off, there's I've even seen roll on, rag off. So, um, uh, what would you guys recommend and are there any ways that you would tell guys, hey, don't don't apply our stain this way or or we don't recommend? So again, all those methods that you just mentioned are approved methods. Uh, I'm a huge fan of buffing stain on and off uh, with carpet cut into 16 inch circles to go on the buffer. Yeah. Uh, the nice thing about that is that one, your your coverage rate doubles. You know, our published coverage rate is 800 to 1,000 square feet per gallon. Um, if the guy's not water popping just a sanded floor to 100 grit or 120 grit, say he's using a neutral or light colored stain, um, he's going to get about double the our published coverage rate buffing it on and off. Um, yeah. It's the easiest way. It's the most efficient. So contractor, a one or two man crew, 1,000 square feet, um, buffing the stain on with uh, – Carpet can usually accomplish that in about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, contractors are no longer having to crawl around on their hands and knees, rag on and rag off. Uh, the pitfalls of rag on, rag off, one is that it's time consuming, it's labor intensive. If it's a big floor, 2,500, 3,000 square feet, that lasts 750 to 500 square feet. They're getting tired, they're sweaty, they may not be 
ragging that stain off as effectively as they did in the beginning. So that leaves a film, which can that film can lead to uh, some adhesion issues. So this, the buffing on is just a better practice. Um, and we get guys off their knees and make them more efficient on their process. Um, rag on, rag off. A lot of guys still do it out there, Daniel. It's not a problem. The thing I would caution about that is that if they're taking their stain rag and putting it in a can. We want them to kind of squeeze that rag out so they're not just putting a massive amount of stain in one spot and then smearing it because that one area where that rag first touches the floor, it really floods that floor with stain and then they work it down to where it runs out and then they re repeat. So it may have some, the overall effect will be the same, but that stain down below is flooded that floor. It's going to take a lot longer to dry in that area. Gotcha. So maybe risk of bleed back or something like that, or white lines or those kind of things. Yeah, all of that. Yeah. Okay. So what, you know, talk about carpet pads on a buffer. Um, what does that process typically look like for a guy who's um, doing it? So you cut out that 16 inch pad. You've, I know we even sell those now. We've got pre stamped 16 inch pads that most guys are using. So guy is going to get have a 16 inch pad and what's that process going to look like in terms of applying the actual stain um so just for clarification um i do the same thing i always say carpet pad but we're actually talking about actual carpet not the carpet padding that goes underneath so i just i don't want people to get confused i do the same thing i say use a carpet pad and they're like like the foam stuff i'm like no actual <laughs> carpet so carpet yeah. circles 16 inch circles we're, we're for Argument's sake, we're going to call it a, it's a carpet pad, but it's really actual carpet. So you have two of them, um, say we're doing 500 square feet. Yep. Your first one is what I call your on um, pad. Mm -hmm. And you just flip that over. They're going to pour a four to six inch pancake of stain in the center. Flip it back over, set the buffer on it and start buffing the field. So that's yep. your on pad. And then it's up to the contractor whether they want to rag on rag off before or after uh, i'm a bigger fan of if they're doing a three to four foot wide area go ahead and buff on your stain in the field and then your guy's gonna cut guy's gonna cruise around rag on rag off the edges he's only got about two to three inches to rag on rag off and then your other carpet circle is the one that you buff off all the excess and you just keep repeating that process depending on the stain color those two carpet circles will, will cover 500 to 750 square feet before the on circle or pad becomes oversaturated. And you can tell when that starts to occur because that will start spitting out stain on the edges. And so you put that to the side, dispose of it correctly. Your off pad now becomes your new on pad. And then you get another carpet circle to be your off pad. And you just keep repeating that process. Gotcha. Uh, that's how it works. Um, again, generally, your typical floor in that 750 to 1500 square foot range, about three carpet circles, about four or five rags, and that's all you're going to need to put all that stain on versus half a box of rags or whatever. Right. Okay. And how's the guy going to tell, like, when he needs to reload that carpet pad with more stain? Is it just a little bit thinner, not as much color going down on the floor? Just kind of yeah. eyeball it. Okay. Yeah, you just eyeball it. You'll see it actually just die right out, and they just park that to the side and, and reload it. Yep. Okay. And then what uh, what's the typical dry time for your stain? What kind of conditions are you looking for, and, and then about how much dry time? Well, our, our environmental conditions are published on the cans. Um, you know, your typical home environment of that, you know, 30 to 50 percent relative humidity, Although here in Colorado, we rarely ever achieve that, but our, our stains work just fine here. You know, and in that temperature range of, you know, 65 to 70 degrees or, you know, 75 degrees, uh, again, we're gonna caution against having extreme temperatures or sunlight beating on the floor, try and diffuse that heat. Um, typical dry time for most of our stains is two to three hours. So they dry very quickly. Um, our white stain is a six hour dry time. And then some of our heavier pigmented stains like our cocoa, bark, and even our ebony is a 12 to 18 hour dry time. Um, one cautionary thing is if a contractor is mixing, let's say, white stain with neutral 
Well, neutral is a two to three hour dry time, but if he's got any white mixed in with that neutral, you're always gonna default to the longer dry time. So if there's white in there or cocoa or bark, you're gonna obey the longer dry time, not that two to three hours if they're mixing colors. Gotcha, okay, awesome. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, error correction. Um, you know, sometimes guys will come back the next day and they'll see little spots on the floor or there may be a heavy spot or something like that. You know, do they got to do a little bit of touch up before they start coding. So what are uh, some tips and techniques you can give for a guy if he needs to touch up your stain? Uh, I'm a pretty cautious guy by nature, so I like to approach things in baby steps. Uh, don't break out the edger because you got a boot print in the floor. Um, you know, a lot of times the stains, because they do reactivate, um, you just get a little cut piece of maroon pad, um, get your stain all mixed up, dip your maroon pad in there, and just do a wet buff on there with that maroon pad and see if you can reactivate everything and blend it in. Um, we will have a, uh, a link um, to our e-learning series on doing touch-ups. Uh, a lot of YouTube videos out there that Bonus produced showing uh, a dark stain or a dark blemish or too light of an area and the tips and tricks to fix that up. But start out easy with just a maroon pad and do a wet buff on there and see if that takes care of it. Um, if it doesn't, then you could break out some sandpaper or scraper and, and do that little touch up and then get it to blend in there. Gotcha. Okay. Now, are there any types of, of finish that uh, you would not recommend putting over this? I know most guys are going to go with the urethane finish. They're going to put an oil poly. They're going to put a water poly over the top. Is there anything you would tell guys to avoid putting uh, over the top? Yeah, I'm just going to promote the, the bonus system that if you're using a bonus stain that any of our finishes will work with our stains. Um, so, you know, those guys out there, they're still using shellacs and acid cure finishes and stuff. We're not testing for compatibility. So stick with the bonus system that our, all of our finishes and sealers are compatible with our stains. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Actually, I've got a uh, real quick question. With the reactivation, um, is there any way to layer your stains or ceruse with the stains at all, or um, would that just be an entirely different process? Uh, that would be an entirely different process. If you want to get that ceruzine or two-tone effect, then uh, I would recommend our craft oils. Okay. Um, but our stains, is it's a one-coat uh, application. So you know, if the contractor uh, puts down special wall that homeowner comes home at after work and they look at the floor and they're like, yeah, we signed off on that. We like that stain, but now it's just a little too light. We want it darker. Um, you, we don't want contractors to put in another coat of stain on there to get it darker. Um, you will run into adhesion issues or you could run into adhesion issues. So um, if it's too light, the overall floor um, they've got to just sand it down and, and do something else, either a different color stain or water pop it in that case. But the stains, to re-blend them, we're talking about taking care of a little spot. Um, that's okay to do that wet buffing and fix that repair that you need to fix. Yes, you're putting stain on stain, but you're also limiting it to a smaller area and taking off all the excess. When I'm talking about stain on stain is an entire floor we don't want that to happen gotcha okay awesome well uh is there anything that a guy needs to do after he's put the stain on and let it dry before he starts coating um besides vacuuming and making and tacking and making sure the floor is clean yeah just do a dry tack um we have a 48 hour window uh, that a contractor could put our stain down he's got 48 hours before he would have to do anything outside of a vacuum and tack uh, to put a stain or put a, a sealer or a finish on the floor. If you do go over 48 hours, um, we want that stain to be lightly abraded. Uh, the best method to do that is get one of our maroon pads on a mop pole. And a lot of guys will just cut that maroon pad to fit the rectangular mop head and then just very lightly abrade the floor with the direction of the uh, wood grain um, to open up the, the bonding sites, the hydrogen bonding 
dropping sites and get that stain open back up so that the finish will stick. Um, some guys will use a, a buffer and a maroon pad. That's a little bit risky because you could bust through that stain because of the weight and rotation of the buffer. So the best thing to, if it's been over 48 hours, is a maroon pad on a mop pole and lightly abrade it to, to open it back up, and then you can put a sealer or finish on there. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, I guess the other question I'd have that I'd like to ask with products is if a guy is going to mess this product up and believe me, guys will find unique and interesting ways to do that with just about anything, myself included. Um, what are the, the easiest pitfalls to avoid with your stain? The easiest pitfalls is uh, basically it comes down to the sanding process, um, skipping too many grits you know, going from a 40 to a 100 grit, um, and then the halos around the walls. Um, you know, for guys using a 100 grit screen, for example, um, but he wants to use an orbital to do the edges, and he uses 100 grit sandpaper on the orbital, well, screen and sandpaper are impacting that wood surface differently, so you could get a halo effect. I think that's probably the number one thing that I see is um, blending the field to the edges. So if a contractor's, uh, you know, screens and older technology, um, I'm a bigger fan of using our multi-head or double-sided disc. Um, the nice advantage of that is that our multi-head, you could have 100 or 120 grit black paper on that multi-head. It's pre-punched with eight holes, so it'll fit on an orbital. And so now you're using 100 or 120 grit black on the multi-head. And on the orbital, so now you're using same grit, same color paper to blend everything together. I think that's probably the number one error that I see out there, Daniel. Gotcha. Awesome. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the uh, videos and learning uh, resources that you put together for contractors. I know you guys do a good job of that, and uh, it's good information for contractors and guys out there who want to get a little bit more in-depth with your products and your systems. Yeah, we just did a new uh, YouTube video. Uh, it's actually about an hour and six minutes long. So it's a lengthy video, but it's a very in-depth video. Um, we're showing different techniques, um, you know, the buffing on and off of the carpet circles, uh, using a cut pad um, to cut along the edges and then ragging off the excess. Um, but that's a very in-depth video on our stains. Uh, we did a mock-up in our studio with two by fours to replicate rooms and hallways. So it's a, it's a good representation of what contractors would uh, run into in a typical scenario. Um, that YouTube video is available on Instagram, uh, Bona underscore pro. You can find that. I'm sure you guys will upload that link as well. And then if contractors ever want any more information or YouTube videos, they can, you know, direct message me or their local territory manager, and we can share all these videos. We also have our e-learning platform, um, which each territory manager has the passcodes and login information. So again, contractors can reach out to their local territory manager and get set up with our e-learning process, not only to go over stains, but the entire bone lineup from adhesives to floor care to finish and sealers. Awesome. Well, Ryan, thanks for joining us. Thanks for all the info uh, on your staying and, and appreciate everything, man. I appreciate the time, guys. Uh, best of luck out there. And if, again, if you have any questions or need further information, you can reach out to me or your local territory manager at Bona. Appreciate it. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys later. All right. Take care, guys. Sweet. All right. So we got that and we will... This will save to our server, and I'll get this to Katie and Caleb, and um, hopefully they can get this video uploaded instead of our disaster three-part series. <laughs> yeah, not a problem. Yeah, they'll have to do some editing, um, but yeah, as soon as you hit record, <clears throat> it's recorded in the entire conversation. Um, so yeah, they'll probably have to trim some off the end, and of course here, or in the beginning, but then here at the end as well. Um,